Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Amma abad fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim Bismillahi rahman rahim Wa salatu wa salamu alayka ya Rasulullah Wa ala alika wa sahabika ya Habib Allah Wa salatu wa salamu alayka ya Nabi Allah Wa ala alika wa sahabika ya Nur Allah Please also repeat after me, Nawaitu Sunnat al Aitikaf. <clears throat> My dear Islam brothers and viewers of Madhid Shana, whenever you are blessed with an opportunity to come to the house of Allah, i.e. the masjid, the first thing that you must realize is that Allah Azza wa Jalla has blessed you. Allah chose you. You are the chosen ones that have been able to come to his house. There are also many blessings in reciting through the park upon the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam. The final messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that on the day of judgment when there will be no shade, there will be no shade except for three types of people. Number one will be he who removes or will he removes a problem from a fellow Muslim, from a fellow Ummati. Number two will he who revives the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And number three is he who spends his time in reciting through the park upon the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallu ala al-khabib. But dear Islam brothers and viewers of Muna Channel, when you get ill, what do you do? You, you take a tablet. You know, if you've got a little bit of pain, you'll take a paracetamol or something. And after taking the painkillers, if the symptoms are not resolved, you're not getting any better, then you go and see the doctor. And the doctor will give you a prescription. Take these medicines. Now, if your illness becomes more serious, you refer to a specialist. If in seeing the specialist, you become more serious, you become admitted into the hospital. When you get admitted into the hospital, if again your health deteriorates to such an extent, then you get admitted into the high dependency unit. And when you're really, really critical, you then get into, in, admitted into the ICU. So as our illnesses increase, we need more and more people to help us. Initially, you just need a tablet. Then you need a doctor, then you need a specialist, then you need the whole hospital staff, then you need the high dependency unit, then you need the ICU staff. So more and more people are needed to you. The question I'm asking you today is, how ill is the Ummah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And if we look at just some of the illnesses that are affecting the Ummah, then we realize how much we all need to do. If we look at the alcohol situation, and these are some of the figures that I'm going to give you today. They're quite old figures. That more than 100,000 people are admitted every year just because of alcohol-related illnesses. If we look at drugs, it is stated that in this country now, teenagers that don't take drugs are a minority. It has affected us so much. So many people make the phone call. Can you please help my son? Can you please spend some time with him? And through the sisters, it's a similar story. Can you please help my husband? He's into drugs. All of these things are happening around us. Two things we need to do. We need to prevent illnesses that are happening so we don't have to make that phone call. So many times we get the phone call, can you please help my son? Can you please help my brother? Can you please help my husband? And unfortunately, it's not just the brothers that are involved in drugs. It's also, can you please help my daughter? I remember a time where an 11-year-old Muslim girl was expelled from school for selling drugs. These are realities. And what happens is we're here in the masjid. We're here in the house of Allah. And the people that are here today, we're here because we've got an Islamic mindset. But what happens is in reality, we're in a bubble. The ills of society that are happening out there, we're not aware of them because we're in this bubble. But then things are happening. So we need to prevent the illnesses before they happen. When a child is born in this country, when a child is born in this country, the first thing that will happen within hours of that child being born, in the heel, they'll put a vitamin K injection. 
After two months, your child will be brought, called in and they'll have vaccination jobs at three months, at four months, between 12 and 13 months, meningitis, uh, all these pneumococcal infections, MMR jobs, all of these things, three years, four years, 12 years, 13 years, diphtheria. And then as you get older, even now we're all getting offered the flu jobs and we're getting the COVID jobs. What are all these jobs? What are all these infections, these, infect uh, these vaccinations that a child has? You know, you're, these young children that are sitting here today, for the last first 12 years of their life, they're constantly having vaccinations. Why? Why are they having these vaccinations? Why? Because when they are then ready, so that when they go into society, where the diseases exist, the MMR and all these other diseases, whatever you want to call them, then diseases that exist, they're vaccinated. They are protected. The question I want to ask you today is, with vaccination the body, what about vaccinating the soul? What moral vaccinations are we given to ourselves to vaccinate, to protect ourselves from these illnesses? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, save yourselves. Save yourselves and your family. This is a hukum. This is an order. Not just to save yourselves. It is your duty to save yourselves and your family. From what? From that fire whose fuel is storms and humans. And if we look at the parents, where are the parents in a children's life? If you look at the father, our first and second generation people that came from Pakistan and India, they spent most of their time working literally 24 hours a day so they could build bungalows back home. The biggest koti in Kashmir, the biggest koti in whatever it was. And this is what they spent all the time doing. And if you asked them, parents, why are you doing this? Why are you working so much? They said, oh, we're doing it for our children. The next generation, my generation and the generation afterwards, we've burdened ourselves so much that we haven't got time for our children. I remember inviting someone on a Madhuri Kafla and he said, look, you pay my mortgage and I'll go on a 12-month Madhuri Kafla. Okay. I'm so burdened with debt. We burden ourselves with debt. And because we burden ourselves with debt, we can't give our children time. And again, you ask them, why are you doing this? I'm doing it for my children. Them courtes that you build back home, we're starting to see it now. That this generation of children don't go there. They're collecting dust and they don't go there. As parents... We need to spend more time with our children. We need to educate our children. If you ask a parent why they're making all this wealth, they'll say for the kids. But what the kids really need is your time. Parents should get to know their kids better. Parents should know the children's likes and the dislikes. People should know, the children should know where they are and where they're not. I remember I look back at my blessed father. He passed away five or six years ago. He, the one thing he used to get annoyed at knowing where I was and where I wasn't. He wanted to know where I was all the time. He wanted to know who my friends were all the time. Not only who my friends were, but who my friend's parents were as well. And sometimes he would say, no, don't go there. That person should not be your friend. You should not be here. You should not be there. And I look back in that time, I was a little bit angry thinking, why does he keep on telling me this? But my father was looking out for me. And then parents sometimes think, well, you know what? I, I'm doing my job because what I do is I send my children to the masjid. They've got an excellent qari there. They've got an excellent madrasa there. Excellent teacher there. He'll sort them out. And I've even heard parents come to the masjid and they'll say to the imam sahab, you know, give the child a few slaps. You know, give him a few slaps. He's out of control at home. We can't do anything about him. That's not the answer. Number one, it's illegal to do this, but we cannot shift the responsibility of our children onto the masjid. So on the day of judgment, when you will be asked, about the upbringing of your children, you cannot say, oh, I had a really good kari. I sent him to a really good madrasa. There was a masjid next door to me. That's not, your, that's not enough. You need to give them child. On the day of judgment, you will be asked the way your kids are brought up, not how the imam brought up your kids. As parents, we need to set an example for our kids that they follow us. We expect our children to do things, and yet we're not doing them ourselves. We don't want our children listening to pop music. We don't want to li listen to all sorts of things. And yet we are watch watching all sorts of things on our TVs. We don't want our children to go to the cinemas. But what are you watching at home on the TVs? What example are you setting for your children? You don't want your children, you want your daughter to wear a scarf, yet the mothers have never worn the scarf. You want them to read their salah, yet you don't read their salah. We are creating a generation. We are creating a generation of children now that don't believe that Salah is five times a day, they believe Salah is five times a week. 
And I'll tell you what. These young children that come to the madrasa here, madrasas up and down the country, when they're in the madrasa, they will read the salah on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. When they go home, none. So how many times are they reading it? Not five times a day, five times a week. We are creating this. So many times I've seen it with my own eyes in our madrasas and many madrasas. That for example, it's the time for Asr or it's the time for Isha. And what we do is we try and keep the children behind so they can read that salah before they go. And the parents are outside sitting in the car. When I said to you at the beginning that Allah has blessed you to be able to come into the house of Allah, then people that are sitting in their car, waiting for the children to come out, and they're not coming in, they're not coming out quick because they're reading the salah. The father, unfortunately, cannot make the journey from his car to the masjid to read the salah, even though he's just there. This is the reality. So what kind of message are you sending your children? My father never reads the salah, why should I? My mother never reads the salah, why should I? We need to be the example. As parents, we need to praise our children as well when they're doing something right. And unfortunately, you may think, yeah, well, I do. I do praise my children when they do something right. But how many times, I've seen it with my own eyes, that when a child swears for the first time, instead of telling that child off, we'll snigger, we'll laugh. I've even seen it, Astaghfirullah, that when a daughter is dancing and the parents are clapping when they're dancing to the music. When the children are outside and they say something wrong and they say some, they'll swear outside at the shop or something, the shopkeeper, and tell, instead of telling off the child and they'll, they'll just laugh it off. Every time you do this, every time you do this, every time you laugh it off, you're sending a message to that child. This is okay. My mom's happy. My dad's happy. What have I got to worry about? And then unfortunately, rather than stopping them from doing that thing that they've done wrong, when they do something right, instead of praising them, we're stopping them. How many times have we seen that a, a, a parent's reading his salah and the son comes in, the daughter comes in and goes in front of him? What happens then? Oh, get this child out. Do you not read? I'm reading my salah. Let me read my salah in peace. And you kick the child out of the room. Why? Why have we done this? Why are we not allowing that child to be there? He can't read the salah properly. He'll lie on the ground. He'll roll over. He'll, whatever he'll do. Let him try and copy you. When he's copying you, even though he's not doing it properly. MashaAllah, bitch, he read the salah today. MashaAllah. In a couple of hours time, we're going to be reading it again. We'll read it one more time before we go to sleep. You're praising that child. It's not further upon that child to read the salah, but by praising that child, that child is now getting a message that, look, if I do this, this is something good. Even though it's not further upon him. We see in households that when the month of Ramadan comes, as Muslims, we're supposed to fast between dawn and sunset. But many households, alhamdulillah, they get the children to do a quarter fast, do a half fast. There is no such thing as a quarter fast, as a half fast. However, what we do is, before the age that it's further upon them children to do it, we say, better you do a half a fast. Yeah. And the child feels now part of the community that I've done something, I've achieved something, I've done half a fast, I've done a quarter fast. And when he does that half fast, even though it's not further upon him, even though there's no such thing as a half a fast, make a special arrangement. Mashallah, today you did half a fast, we're going to get a cake today. We're going to get the pieces in today. And that child feels happy now. We should give them that, that hope, that happiness, show them that, mashallah, you're doing something good. At a young age, like the young kids that are here today, the parents have made the effort and brought them here. We should all be doing that. If we're not doing that, where, where do you think our children are right now? They're not at home reading the Quran, I can tell you that. We need to set that example. Similarly, at the homes with our sisters, they need to set the example with their daughters. As fathers, you need to be the best friend of your son. As mothers, we need to be the best friend of our daughters. When a child, when your daughter is young and you put the scarf on them, mashallah, better you look beautiful. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Now what's happening here? You're sending a message to that child that I look beautiful when? When I put a scarf on. But what's happening in our houses when they put the makeup? Oh, mashallah, you got really good, nice makeup on. You look beautiful. What again, what kind of message are you sending to that child? We are the writers of the child. I remember many years ago, someone saying to me that like children are like pieces of paper, whatever you write to them, they'll become like that. But then I, I read a saying of Sayyidina Hazrat Ali radiallahu He said, children are like stone. Whatever you inscribe in the stone stays there forever. This is what our children are like. 
We are inscribing in them at a young age. As parents, we need to instill the pride of Islam in them. You know, so when a child gets to the age of 12, 13, 14, and all of a sudden peer pressure starts coming on them. They're at school, they're at college. You know, cigarettes have been offered, drinks have been offered, parties have been offered. All these things have been offered to your son and your daughter. Has your child got enough pride inside them that they can say, no, I'm a Muslim, I don't do that. I'm a Muslim, I don't drink alcohol. I'm a Muslim, I don't smoke. As a Muslim, I don't go to these parties. Where are they going to get this from? From us. We need to make our children proud of who they are. Rather than skimpering away and saying, oh, you know, uh, okay, I'll do this. But forget our children, we're the same. We're in a work environment when it comes to the time of his salah. We feel embarrassed to go and read our salah. We're not proud to be Muslims. How can we make our children to be proud of Muslims? We need to make our children aware of the heroes of Islam, the rich heritage that we have. Nowadays, unfortunately, our children know more about football than they know about the companions of the Prophet of Allah I've used this example many times before. If I was to ask the people in this room, the youngsters in this room to name me 10 football players, you could probably do it. 10 cricketers, you could probably do it. Astaghfirullah, there are probably people in this room that can name 10 actors, 10 singers. But how many of us in this room can name the Ashram of Ashram, those 10 companions that were guaranteed paradise? Okay, let's make it easier. 10 any companions. Let's make it even easier. 10 prophets of Allah. How many of us can do this? And we realize that we know more about football than we know more about the deen of Islam. And then we wonder why we are where we are. Why are we in this predicament? That we don't know all these basic things. And our children now have these people as their role models. These people as effectively the idols that they look up to. They try and have the haircuts like them. They try to wear their clothes like them. They try to have the jackets like them. They try to have the shoes like them. They try to have the watches like them. They try to drive the cars like they're driving. What about the Muslim role models? What do we know about these? You hear the names. Abu Bakr, Osman, Ali. Umar. What do we know about these people? The great companions of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi We don't know anything about them. What do we know about the life of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi How many of us, don't raise your hands, how many of us have actually gone away and read a seerah of the life of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi How many of us have done this? Our role model, the greatest of all creation. What do we know about him? What do we know about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We say we are Muslims. You know more about the people in number 10 than you know about the Prophet of Allah How sad is that? It's something that we need to think about. I remember in a discussion someone was talking and they were saying that we need we need Salauddin Ayyubi to come. The way that the Ummah is struggling now, we need Salauddin Ayyubi to come. And the person said to me, no. Before Salauddin Ayyubi, you need the mother of Salauddin Ayyubi. Where is the mother of Salauddin Ayyubi? And if we look at the deen of Islam, Islam puts this emphasis on the mother so much. The tarbiyah that they go, and if you look at the history of Islam, many of the fathers were out spreading the deen of Islam. Many of the fathers were out on jihad. It was the mother that gave the tarbiyah. But what do our mothers know now? They know what dramas are coming on. What time they're coming on. What channel they're coming on. They can tell you the stories of these dramas. They can't tell you the stories of the companions of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet of Allah said, seek education from the cradle to the grave. What does this mean? From being a small child, the child is to be trained and prepared to be part of the Muslim community. That is our responsibility. You don't enter any race without training. The training. Why are you entering the world without any training? You go on a marathon or you, 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 you know, that takes, I don't know, four hours to run. But you're training for six months. We expect our children to go into the world with no training. It is our responsibility. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to instruct our children to begin praying at the age of seven and then to scold them if they do not pray at the age of ten. Why did the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do this? Why did he say, tell them at seven and then scold them at ten? Why? Training period. Training period. That's the period that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is giving us. Prepare your children. In the same way, the fast that I mentioned, the half fast, in the same way for our daughters, the hijab, when it's not further upon them, start putting it upon them. 
This is all about training. So that time will come. And there's many households where I've seen that the children hate getting up for Fajr. But then the time comes when they get the parents up for Fajr. Why? Because at that young age, they've been given that tarbiyat. This is our responsibility. Unless we instill this in our children, how do you expect them? You expect our children to grow up pious. You expect our children to grow up looking after us. You expect our children to grow up respecting us. And you've done nothing about it. It doesn't work in anything else. You know, if you want your business to be successful, it involves your time. It involves your effort. It involves your research. It involves your study. You want your children to be successful? They'll do it themselves. It doesn't work like that. There's a few things I want to discuss with briefly mention to you today of things that we need to be very worried about bringing up our children. Number one is lying. Lying is so prevalent in our children. And we've all heard the great story of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. I don't know if you've heard this, but I'll quickly mention it. That when he left his place of Jilan to go to Baghdad, when he left, his mother said to him, that my son, no matter what happens, always speak the truth. And on the way to Baghdad, they went in a caravan. They were robbed. And he'd hidden gold coins. His mother had hidden gold coins here. And they couldn't find him. The robbers couldn't find it. And when he was eventually asked, where is this gold? You say you've got it. Where is it? And he give it to them. And they were astonished. That why don't you just lie? You need that money. And he said to them that my mother told me that no matter what happens, speak the truth. And the robbers, 40 of them, they were so astonished that this person had spoken the truth, that they all repented and given all the stolen goods back. And they said that then 40 people became willies of their time as well. Now we all say, yeah, we know. We know that, brother, that lying is very bad. But I'll tell you something, we teach our children to lie. We teach our children to lie. I've seen it in so many households. Someone will ring and you'll pick up the phone. Yeah, 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 I'm at work. Yeah, I'm at work. Okay, speak to you later. You're sitting at home. You're sitting at home and in front of you, you're lying in front of them. Many a time, people that, you know, when they, uh, they go out for Nikki Gidawat, inviting people to the path of righteousness, inviting people to the masjid, they'll knock on the door and say, Is there anybody here we want to invite you to the masjid? And the child will say, Midas told me to tell you I'm not in. What is this? You're teaching your children this. You teach your children this. Just to give you an example that, you know, you, you've got a room and, and there's a vase in the room and the children are playing and the vase breaks and the father comes in, he's angry, he looks at the vase, he sees the broken vase and he said, who's done this? Now the children that are playing, they're, they're scared. It was him, it wasn't me. It was him, it was him, it was him, honestly, it wasn't me. Now what happens under these circumstances? Normally the father either gets angry, punishes them all because he hasn't got time to investigate who actually did it. Or... He calls them with and said, you sort him out, right? And she's got the softness in the heart and she lets them go. So what happens here? What have we taught the children here now? We've taught the child here now, if you lie, either the punishment will get divided or you'll get away with it. So what's lying? Lying's good. We've taught them that. You taught them that lying is good. But if you had that same scenario and you went into that room and that child's there and you say, look, you know, who's done it? And they're scared and it was, it was him. Look, someone's done it, but don't worry. Tell me the truth. If you to tell me the truth, I won't punish you. Now, if one of the children puts his hands up bravely and said, yeah, dad, it was me. Now, how should we react there? Go, oh, I knew it was you. Oh. No, we shouldn't react like that. He said, okay, beta, you know, you've made a mistake. But you know what, beta? I'm happy with you. And the child will be shocked. My dad's happy with me. I've just broken to him. Why is he happy with me? Why am I happy with you, beta? You spoke the truth. And treat him. Go and get something nice for the child. And now all of a sudden, what, what have you taught the child? Tell him the truth is good. You taught him that. It is our actions that teach our children these things. And we need to be wary of this. Similarly, theft. Again, from a young age, children will pick up pens from school, pick up balls from school, pick up all these things from school. Again, unless we stop it at that young age, they think there's nothing wrong with it. And you know, there's a saying in English, finders keepers, losers weepers. That is not what our dean teaches us. That's not what our dean teaches us. That if you find something, you can have it. No. If your child found something and you say, where did you find this? Go and put it back. And teach the child to go and put it back. To go and put it back in that place. It is not yours. Again, we need to teach the children this. This is our responsibility. If you look at abusive language, swearing. Many of the children that are in this, many of the people that are in this room come from the 
Pakistani Indian subcontinent. If a child speaks Punjabi, for example, why? Because the mother and father speak Punjabi. If the child speaks Gujarati, why? Because the mother and father speaks Gujarati. If the child speaks Chinese, why? Because the mother and father speaks Chinese. If the child swears, why? Because the mother and father swear. Again, you are teaching your children. And I've seen it practically with my own eyes. That parents are swearing in front of children. And then 10 years later, that same child is swearing at his father. And I remember there was a person where 10 years ago when I tried to stop him swearing in front of his children. And he got angry at me, didn't listen to me. And then when that day came that his children were swearing at him, he's sitting there crying. It's too late then. We need to give our children time. We need to be there for them. What tarbiyat do we give to our child? What tools do we give to protect our children? And save themselves from these illnesses of the society. We are so busy earning money, we haven't got time for our children. We think that providing them with the latest games, TV, internet, latest clothes, shoes, cars when they get older, or even getting them married, that's our job. That's not just your job. And if you were to leave your child with a million pounds when you pass away, Obviously, as parents, we want to leave our children with money. Obviously, we want them to have the comforts of their life. But if you leave your children with a million pound, how's that going to benefit you when you're in that dark and lonely grave? They'll spend it, they'll enjoy it. But if you leave your children with the love of the Prophet of Allah in their hearts, if you leave your children with the love of the Quran in their hearts, if you leave your children with the love of the Ali Bayt in their hearts, that will benefit you. And we all know that when you and given something that you've not earned, you don't value it. I remember my blessed father, he told me a story that someone in Pakistan was wearing a 5,000 rupees shawl and he had 200 rupees shoes. And his shoes got dirty and took the shawl off and started cleaning his shoes. And someone said to me, you've got an expensive shawl and you're cleaning these shoes. He said, them shoes, I earned the money for them. This shawl, my father gave it me. You value what you've earned. So when we give this money to our children, they don't value it. They'll enjoy it, but they don't value it. What we need to do is give them time. What we need to do is give them this weapons effectively to fight, to fight them, to protect them from these shaitanic whispers. Do you know that in the UK alone, more than 6,000 children, more than 100 children every week phone up helplines to talk about their loneliness? They're lonely, so they phone up these helplines to, ask, to talk to somebody. Do we know where our children are all the time? Do we know who our friends are? Do we know what our children like and dislike? We ourselves have distanced ourselves from our children. We should be our children's best friends. They should be able to discuss everything with us. They should be able to ask anything from us. Ask anything from us. And this is another thing. A child, if he, if he builds up the courage and asks dad, you know, dad, you know, is it all right to have a girlfriend? Dad, is it all right to, to smoke opium? Dad, is it all right to smoke pot? Is it all right to do this? What do we do then? We shout to the child, but the reason, why are you talking like this in the house? Get out of the house. I'm going to kick him out of the house. Instead of giving him an answer, and what happens now, he goes outside and he goes to his friends and he asks them the same question. And I guarantee you nine times out of ten, the answer that he'll get outside is not the Islamic answer. It is our responsibility as parents that when our children come into our house, whatever they ask, whatever they ask, our job is to find the answer. Now, we're not all knowledgeable. I don't know everything. But Alhamdulillah, Dawes Lami here in the UK has created the scholars, the English speaking scholars. Why did we do this? Why did Dawes Islami open Jamaat al Madinas in the UK? Huge expense, huge headache, huge tension. But why have we done it? So that we can bridge the gap. So that these English speaking scholars, they are the ones that can help us, help our children. That the questions that they have, they can come and speak to them. And say, This is, I don't understand this. What is this? Is it halal? Is it haram? Is it okay? Is it not okay? And they will educate our children. And they are the bridge to help us. When they ask these awkward questions, we need to have the answers. And like I said, if we don't give them the Islamic answer, they'll find the answer elsewhere. In the same way, we don't want our children to miss a single day from school. We'll drag them out of bed. No matter how they feel, they might be feeling cold, they might be feeling tired, they might have a cough, they might have a cold. We'll drag them out of bed and put them in the school. But when it comes to madrasa, okay, better, have a rest. Dawat Islami, in the form of Mubalix, will provide the doctors to help us all. This platform here is for you. In this platform, even in the UK, we've seen drug dealers become namazi. We've seen thieves become alims. 
And all this is possible through the beautiful mahal of Dawah Islami. Irrespective, and this is another point that I want to make here, irrespective, and this is mainly for the youngsters here, of whether or not our parents have given the Islamic upbringing or not. Because maybe some of you are thinking here, that look, well, my father didn't do this for me. Yeah, you're right, but my mother didn't do this, my father didn't do this. No matter what, no matter whether they give you zero tarbiyat, it does not give you the right to be disrespectful to your parents. With regards to our parents, it says in the Quran, do not pray to anyone except Allah and be gentle to your parents. And during your life, if they or any one of them reach to the old age, you should not even utter a rude word in front of them. Do not scold them. Talha ibn Mayas narrates one of his incidents. He said, I went with the army to participate in a battle. And there I was caught up in sins. In my view, they were major sins. I was very upset and finding an opportunity, I told Abdullah bin Umar about it. He asked me what had happened and I told him the truth. Listen to all of this, he said to me that these are not mortal sins. He said, I'll tell you the serious sins, there are nine of them. Number one, to associate partners with Allah, to murder someone unjustly, to run from war, from war, to malign an innocent woman, to eat from earth street, to eat from an orphan's wealth, to talk blasphemously in a masjid, to mock a religion, and to cause parents to weep by disobeying them. After telling him this, he asked me whether I want to stay away from the hell and enter the heaven. I said, why not? This is what I want. Abdullah bin Umar then said to me, tell me, are your parents alive? I said, yes, my mother is alive. He said, by Allah, if you speak with your mother in a tender tone and with due respect and fulfill her needs, you will definitely enter into paradise. Only avoid these sins. Your mother could be your ticket to paradise, depending on how you treat them. With regards to your father, Allah's pleasure and anger is hidden in the parents' pleasure and anger. The father's disobedience is Allah's disobedience. The father's obedience is Allah's obedience. They are both your heaven and they're your hell. A sahaba came to the Prophet of Allah and decided that he wanted to go to war. And he said, I've come for your command. And the Prophet of Allah said to him, is your mother alive? And he said, yes. He said, go and serve your mother. The paradise is under her feet. The Prophet of Allah said that should I not make you aware of what is the biggest sin? Should I not point out to you what is the worst sin in all of the sins? The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah tell us. He said to declare someone of the partner of Allah and to harass parents. Both are the worst sins of all. We all know that to associate partners with Allah is the gravest sin. But so many times in the Hadith and in the Quran, well, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, worship me alone and respect your parents. Worship me and be kind to your parents. Worship me and look after your parents. And the hadiths are there for it as well. It's said that a man's provision a cup, come a cut when he starts praying for his parents. We should continue to pray for our parents. And if someone visits the graves of one or both the parents in order to earn her reward, he will earn the reward of an accepted hajj. And if someone visits them in abundance, angels will come to visit his grave when he dies. If someone performs hajj on behalf of his parents, he himself will gain the reward of 10 hajj. You know, this is the beauty of the deen of Islam. That if I was to recite through the park and I say, I pass it on to someone that's passed away, I've not lost it. It's not as if, oh, I pass on this phone to someone and I'm no longer with the phone. No, it doesn't work like that. The mercy of Allah, the bounty of Allah is great that if I pass on the reward of through the Pakhtas one, I will also get the reward. I won't lose it. So we should always make good intentions that whenever you perform a good deed, say to yourself that this is passed on to my loved ones. On a daily basis, re recite Surah Ikhlas three times. We're told that the reward of reciting Surah Ikhlas three times is equivalent to the Quran. Recite it with the intention that I pass this reward on to the deceased ones. This is the beauty of our deen. Back at the beginning, I mentioned that the Ummah is ill. If we are all ill, physically, and the doctors stay at home, what chance have we got? No chance. If the doctors don't open the surgery, and the doctors are not there, when we're ill, what's going to happen to us? We're going to get more ill. In the same way, if we know that the Ummah is ill, and we sit at home and do nothing about it, what's going to happen? It is our job to do something about it. Dawat Islami has given us a prescription for our illnesses. And this is the form of the Pious Deeds booklet. 
the pious deed booklet is something that if you just look at it, read it, and it'll be like the do's and don'ts that you need to do on a daily basis, do's and don'ts that you need to do on a monthly basis. You know, we analyze our lives. We analyze our businesses. What can we do to improve our business? What can we do to make more money? Do we analyze our day-to-day -day routine and say, what am I doing wrong on a day-to-day -day basis? Dal Islami provides the training to become the doctors of the Ummah in the form of the Madri Kafla. By traveling in the Madri Kafla, you will be trained, you will become that person that can help the Ummah. Sayyidina Musa Islam asked Allah Azza wa what is the reward for someone who invites someone to the path of righteousness? And Allah Azza wa replied that I write one year's of worship in his good deeds for every word that he speaks. Now note, if you, I don't know if you've read that or heard that before. But Sayyidina Musa Islam said to Allah Azza wa what is the reward for someone who invites? Not being successful in inviting. If I invite 10 people and nobody turns up, I will still get the reward. Do you understand? I invite 10 people to the ishtama, nobody turns up, I will still get the reward. The farmer's job is to plant the seed. The rest is up to Allah. But when the farmer plants seeds and they don't grow into trees, what does he do? He doesn't stop, he keeps on planting seeds. That's our job. We must never give up, and we must never give up on anybody either. A true story from many years ago, many, many years ago now. In Scotland, there was a person in the community, a Muslim in the community, that he was a known alcoholic. Everybody knew he was always drinking alcohol. But there was a mobilic that every, whenever he saw them, he'd invite him to the ishtama. Whenever he saw him, he'd invite him to Juma. And no, he didn't, didn't want to listen. But then one Juma, on the day of Juma, when he invited him, all of a sudden something happened in his heart. And he said, you know what? I'll come with you today. Yeah. I'll come to Juma. And he said, but my clothes are, you know, they're dirty and I need to go home and have a shower. So I'll go home and I'll shower and I'll see you in the masjid. And the bubble thought, you know, I've grabbed him. I've finally got hold of him. We're not going to let him go now. Yeah. He said, I'll come home with you. This is a true story. I'll come home with you. You get changed, you have a shower and I'll take you to the masjid. So he went home, had a shower, changed his clothes, came to the masjid with him, took one step inside the masjid, had a heart attack and died. Now we know that our Iman tells us that death is destined. We know where we're going to die. Allah knows. But if that person had given up on him, yeah, he's an alcohol, leave him. No, never give up on anybody. In the same way that the farmer never stops planting the seeds, we should never stop planting the seeds with people here. We should never try to stop helping people. It is our job to help people, to protect people. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said that we are one body, we are one ummah. And when any part of it feels the pain, we should all feel the pain. Like we're seeing what is happening in Palestine, we're all feeling the pain. What is happening around the world, we're all feeling the pain. We feel the pain in Palestine, we don't feel the pain what's happening outside here. What is happening to the ummah in Nottingham? What is happening to the ummah in the Midlands? Do we not, are we not aware of that? We don't feel the pain? Someone once said to me, it's as if the, um, the ummah has been given an anesthetic. I said, what do you mean? He said, when you go to the dentist, they give you an anesthetic. They give you an injection. And when they give you that injection, after that, they can pull your teeth out, drill your teeth, you don't feel anything. He said, the ummah has been given an anesthetic. They don't feel anything. They don't care about anybody. Even when it comes to things like Palestine, we feel it a little bit for an hour or so. We see a social, hi, hi, toba, toba. And then, forget it. This is what we become like. Like I said at the beginning, I'm all right, Jack. As long as I'm okay, I don't care about anybody else. This is what we become like. And on the day of judgment, you will be questioned. You'll be questioned at what time you had. You'll be questioned about your youth. You'll be questioned about your strength. The money that you spent, the money that Allah gave you. Allah gave you that money. Remember this. The money that you have today, Allah gave you. You may think, I work hard for this. I work 12 hours a day for this. I did a degree for this. I worked hard and studied hard for this. Who give you that strength to work hard? Who give you that intellect to be able to get that degree? Who give you that opportunity? Many of the people that are in this room are, the, if these people are in this room or not the people in this room, the forefathers, where were they? Were they earning the same kind of amount of money as you? Allah Azza wa Jal give them an opportunity or you an opportunity to come to countries like this to have a better life. What have you done with that? Again, you made the biggest koti back home. You got the biggest car, you got this, you got that. On the day of judgment, will that benefit you? Learn to spend in the way of Allah. Learn to protect your deen. 
I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla if I've said anything wrong, may Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive me. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah give me and you the ability to think about what I've said, to act upon what I've said, and to pass this message on to others as well. Ameen bi jahil nabi alameen. Sallu ala al-habib. Say